Hello, welcome back to Algebra. The title of this lesson is Solving Perfect Square Quadratic Equations. This is part one. So the roadmap here is we're going to be learning different ways to solve quadratic equations. Remember, quadratic just means the highest power of x is a two. So it's an x squared is the highest exponent in the equation. You already know how to solve some quadratic equations. We've actually done it quite a bit. Remember, we factor under those quadratic, uh, uh, under the quadratic, we try to factor into two binomials, setting it equal to zero, setting each of those binomials equal to zero, and solving. The only problem is we can't factor a whole lot of quadratics. You can't factor them most of the time. So if, when you can factor those things, great. But if you can't factor them, you're going to have to use some of these methods we're going to be learning in these uh, lessons here. So these types of quadratics that we're going to have here are called perfect square quadratics. They're very special, and you'll see uh, very obviously why they're special. So the first one is very, very simple. So it's x squared is equal to 3. This is a perfect square uh, quadratic because you'll see as we get into more problems, the power on the x here is, is uh, very easy to eliminate by taking a square root of both sides. And it'll be, again, a little more easy to understand exactly why it's called a perfect square when I can get a few more problems on the board. But now that we've conquered the idea of radicals, you know how to solve an equation like this. See, you didn't know how to solve this before we talked about radicals, but now that we have, you know you can take a square root of both sides. We take a square root on, on the left, and it cancels with the x squared, just leaving the x. When we apply a square root ourselves, we must put the plus minus. We talked about that in great detail in the past. And we'll take the square root of the 3. So we take the square root of both sides, but we just have to uh, put a plus minus in front. So because we have a plus and a minus, there's actually two solutions to this. The first solution is positive square root of 3. And the other solution is negative square root of 3. So you can circle this, the plus minus square root of 3, if you like. Or you can circle the two solutions written out, plus or minus, if you like. Now, we talked about this in the last lesson, but what does it actually mean when you get to two uh, solutions, two roots of a quadratic like this? So we talked about it extensively in the last lesson. I encourage you to go watch that last lesson if you haven't already done so. So what it means is you have these quadratics. They all look like parabolas, either smiley faces like this or upside down frowny faces, uh, you know, uh, uh, parabolas. And the fact that we get two answers means these are the values where the, the actual parabola crosses the x-axis, the intersection points, because those are the places where if we were to subtract this x squared minus 3, that would be where that function is equal to 0. And it's x is equal to positive square root of 3, and x is equal to negative square root of 3. So just to drive it home, we talked about it before, but if you were to graph this thing, it might look something you know, like this, right? So the function here, if you were to rewrite it, f of x is equal to the x squared and subtract the 3 to put everything on one side. So this is the function, x squared minus 3. If we set this thing equal to 0, then we're finding the, uh, the uh, uh, intersection points when the function is equal to 0. And one of them is at positive square root of 3 right there. And the other one is at negative square root of 3, which is right there. So that's just a, a little sketch. But in general, when you're solving equations, you can always move everything to one side. This is the function. And you're setting that function equal to 0 uh, there, which is the intersection points. All right. So let's just crank through a bunch of these guys. Perfect square quadratics. Another one might be like this, x minus 1 squared is equal to 3. How would you solve that? Well, we want to get x by itself. But not only x, but x minus 1 is wrapped up in a parenthetical all squared. But we can get rid of the square. We can release the variable, for lack of a better word, by taking the square root of both sides. Taking the square root of the left is just going to leave what's under here by itself because the square and the square root will then cancel. And then when we apply a square root ourselves, we have to put a plus minus square root of 3. You see how these two solutions look very similar. We just took the square root of the left and the square root of the right, square root of the left and the square root of the right. But now we have this 1 here. So then we need to move it to the right hand side. We'll add it. So then we'll have 1 plus or minus the square root of 3. So again, when you have these pluses and minuses, you can leave it like this. This means there's two distinct solutions. The first solution is 1 plus the square root of 3. That's one answer. And the other solution is that it's 1 minus the square root of 3. So these are the two answers. So you can circle it either as the two answers separately written out, or you can circle it with the plus minus. This means there's two different answers. And again, I'm not going to draw another sketch, but what it basically means is if you were to take and drag this 3 over and make the function f of x is equal to this minus 3, that's the function. You can plot it on a graph. Uh, 
And when you set that function equal to zero, you're finding the crossing points where the function's equal to zero. So when you solve this equation, it's exactly the same thing. I guess I will write it down. It's exactly the same thing as saying the function f of x uh, being equal to x minus 1 quantity squared minus 3, because I just move it over here, that function, I'm going to set this function uh, equal to 0. So x minus 1 quantity squared minus 3 is equal to 0. This equation that you're solving here is exactly the same as what you have. Because notice, if you were going to solve this, you'd move the 3 over first, which is what we were given, then we'd take the square root and we would solve. So pretty much any equation you ever solve, even if there's numbers on the right or, or not, is exactly the same thing as moving everything to one side, calling it a function, and setting that function equal to 0. That's why we spend so much time learning how to find the roots of polynomials, because all of these equations can be thought of as just talking about where the function crosses the x-axis like this. And there's two crossing points, because there's just like there's two crossing points here, uh, we have two crossing points in this case. Now we're going to stop drawing graphs and things and just continue uh, writing down equations. So here we had x squared is equal to 3. Here we have quantity x minus 1 squared is equal to 3. And now we'll change it just a little bit further, and we'll say 2x minus 1 quantity squared is equal to 3. Now you can see the pattern. How do you solve this equation? Well, we have to get rid of this square. So we're going to take the square root of both sides. That will cancel and leave this. On the right, it will be plus or minus the square root of 3. But now I have to solve for x. So I move the 1 over. 2x is 1 plus or minus the square root of 3. And now I'm going to divide by the 2. So it's going to be 1 plus or minus the square root of 3, all divided by quantity of 2. Now there's various ways you can write it. I can break this up into two fractions if I want, but I'm just going to leave it like this. Because you can see there's two answers, 1 plus the square root of 3 divided by 2, or 1 minus the square root of 3 divided by 2. So now that we can see the general pattern here, you can kind of see why it's called a perfect square quadratic. Because what's happening here is the term that involves the variable is just a term squared. See, so you have a, the entire term, the entire parentheses uh, is quantity squared. Uh, here. So it's a perfect square, right? This entire term that involves the variable, the quantity is squared. This entire term that involves the variable is also squared, but it's just a simple case of just x being squared, so it's not so obvious. So you, you know in general when you look at these polynomials, in general a quadratic polynomial looks like something like this, x squared plus you know 3x minus 4. So this is not a perfect square quadratic. It's not a perfect squared quadratic because you have an x squared here and you have an x here. So it's difficult if I were going to set this thing equal to 0. I mean, you might be able to factor it, okay? But if you don't know how to factor it until we learn the methods, you don't know how to solve this because the only way we've really learned how to solve polynomials like that is to factor them and set them equal to 0. But what if this thing's not factorable? Then you're kind of stuck, and that's what we're going to be doing in this, in this lesson. But this is not a perfect square because you have the variable in two places, and one is squared and one is not. But in this equation, the, in, the only place where the variable exists is a term that is squared on one side of the equal sign. The only place where the variable exists is a quantity that is squared on one side of the equal sign. That makes this class of problems easy to solve because we can just take the square root of both sides. That's why we learn it first. It's the easiest kind of equation to learn how to solve. That's a quadratic equation. So another example of that would be y plus 7 quantity squared is equal to 16. How do you solve this? The variable is wrapped up on one side, nice and neat, like a bow with a square. So we can take the square root of the left, leaving y plus 7 left over. The square root of the right will be the square root of 16. So we now know that the square root of 16 is 4. So it's plus or minus 4. And then we can move that 7 to the other side. So what we'll have is when we subtract 7, what we're going to get is negative 7 on the other side plus or minus 4. We just subtract 7, subtract 7. Now you see in these other cases, we left it as plus or minus square root of 3. We left it as plus or minus square root of 3. That's because the square root of 3 is an irrational number. And if you want to be exact, you have to leave it as the square root of 3. But in this case, it's plus or minus 4. So it's actually um, very nice just to be able to write it out because it's easier to see. Negative 7 plus 4, and then y will be negative 7 minus 4. And you can all do addition and subtraction. So what you have is negative 7 plus 4 is going to give you negative 3. And this will be negative 7 minus 4, which will be negative 11. So you have two solutions, negative 3 and negative 11. All right. So the, word, the rule of thumb is if you get down to the plus minus step and you can actually do the math and get numbers, then do it. If you have radicals involved or weird fractions involved, then just leave it alone. All right.
So now that we know the idea of what a perfect square quadratic is, now we can just crank through a bunch of problems to get practice. And they're all going to be the same sort of thing. So what if we have 3y plus 7 quantity squared is equal to 16? It's almost exactly the same thing as we had here, but now we just put a 3 in front of the y here. All that's going to happen here is we're going to take the square root of both sides. 3y plus 7 is left over, plus or minus 4 on the right. Then we have, uh, not sorry, not plus or minus, uh, yeah, let's leave it like this, plus or minus square root of 16. We take the square root of both sides, and on the right we have plus or minus 4. Now we move the 7 over, 3y uh, is equal to negative 7 plus or minus 4, and then y is negative 7 plus or minus 4, all divided by 3. So it's almost exactly the same problem, we're just dividing by 3 at the end, uh, essentially here. And so what you're going to end up having is you'll have two possible scenarios, negative 7 plus 4 over 3, or negative 7 minus 4 over 3. So what you're going to have in this case, negative 7 uh, plus 4 is negative 3 over 3, so that y will be negative 1. You'll circle that as an answer. Or you'll have negative 7 minus 4 is negative 11 over 3. Now I can't really do much with that. I can't simplify it any further, so this is just one of the answers, and this is the other. Negative 1 and negative 11 thirds. All right, just have a couple of additional problems to go here. I have one that I want to draw a quick plot of. What if we have... Uh, let me give myself a little space here. What if we have the equation as follows? x squared is equal to negative 4. Now this equation looks almost identical to the first equation we solved, this one here. We took the square root of both sides, and we got two real numbers. One was a negative square root of 3, one was a positive square root of 3. And we said that that corresponded to a graph where it dipped below the axis, and one of the roots was negative, and one of the roots was positive. That's what it actually means to have two roots like that. Here, the form of the equation is the same. We take the square root of both sides, revealing x is plus or minus the square root of negative 4. But now you all know how to take the square root of negative numbers. We have to use the imaginary numbers. So the square root of the 4 is the 2, and the square root of the negative 1 is the i, so we get plus or minus 2i. So we get two answers, just like before, positive 2i and negative 2i. So I'm going to go ahead and circle this, and um, let's do a quick plot of what that might look like. So as we've looked at in, earlier in the demo, we suspect that there's not going to be any crossing values on the real axis because of what we learned before. And what this graph actually does look like is it looks like this. The, the base graph is x squared, but we have this modification of, of minus 4 here. So it looks like this. 1, 2, 3, 4. The graph actually goes down like this. Because if you were going to plot this function, what you really have here, you have to solve and get everything on one side f of x uh, is equal to x squared plus 4. All you do is you move the 4 to the other side, so it's x squared plus 4. That's the function, x squared plus 4, and then you're setting it equal to 0. Of course, there are no values where it's equal to 0, because if you plot this function, you're taking the x squared function, the regular parabola, and you're adding 4 to it. The regular parabola goes all the way down to the axis, when you add 4 to it, it shifts the whole thing up, so this thing never intersects the axis anymore. So because of that, you don't have real solutions, you have imaginary solutions. And we showed that in the demo that we did before. When you have these any kind of graph that's not crossing the axis, it's up above or down below, it's not, there's no crossing values, and you don't have any real solutions. So, but we do have two solutions, they're just uh, imaginary numbers like this. All right, now while we have this on our mind, let's go and do one more that's very similar to it. What if we change the problem a little bit and we say x plus 7 quantity squared equals negative 4? So this is almost exactly the same problem. Instead of x squared is negative 4, we're just changing it a little bit to be this, but we solve it the same way. Take the square root of both sides, I'm giving you x plus 7 is plus or minus the square root of negative 4. So you have x plus 7 is plus or minus, this becomes 2i, just like it did last time. And then we have to take the 7 over, so we're going to have negative 7 plus or minus 2i. So you see there's still two answers, negative 7 plus 2i and negative 7 minus 2i. Two answers, but they're complex numbers. So because the solutions that we got for both of the roots of this polynomial, or this quadratic, are both uh, complex, right, because of that, then we expect that if you were to graph the function of this thing, there would be no crossing points on the uh, x-axis. So this is the function. We, right now we have it set equal to negative 4, but if we move the 4 over, we can say that this is equivalent to a function, which would be f of x 
is equal to x plus 7 quantity squared plus 4. Why a plus sign? Because what we have here is this equals to this. So if we move this to one side, thereby making it 0 over here, then the function itself is x squared plus 7 squared, I'm sorry, x plus 7 squared plus the 4. That's the function. And then we're looking for these crossing points. If you move it over here, you're going to get uh, x plus 7 quantity squared plus 4 equals 0. If you move the 4 back over here, you're going to get a 0. So this is the function. We're setting the function equal to 0. That's the crossing points. <clears throat> but what you're going to have in, happen or see in this case is you're going to have the 1, 2, 3, 4. That's an important tick mark. And the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This function actually is going to look like a have a parabola that looks something like this. It's going to be shifted four units up because of the plus four here, but because of the seven in here, the parabola, the basic parabola of x squared is going to be shifted seven units to the left. So the parabola, again, is sitting out in empty space with no crossings on the x-axis down here. So because of that, we know it doesn't have any real roots. It has just the two complex roots that we see there. Now, don't worry so much if you don't understand why this thing is shifted where it is. Actually, we're going to have complete lessons on that later down the road. We talk about taking a function and shifting it around and what the graph of it and what the equation looks, uh, looks like when you start shifting the function around. But I'll just give you a little bit of a secret you know, punchline. The basic shape of this graph is just f of x is x squared. It's just an x squared po uh, parabola. But because we have a plus 7, that shifts the parabola to the left. And because we have a plus 4, it shifts the parabola up by 4. And so this is the basic shape, but these numbers just turn out to shift it around into a different location. We're going to talk about exactly why it moves it here, because I know it is a little confusing, negative versus positive here. It looks a little confusing. We'll get to that a little bit later. Now, mostly what I want you to know here is that the graph of this function here, the graph of this function does not intersect the x-axis. So because of that, we get the two uh, imaginary or complex roots rather than real roots. And so our last problem is going to be very similar to this. We're just going to take 2x plus 7. We're going to square it and say negative 4. We've done it so much, we'll just fly through it real quick. We take the square root of both sides uh, here. And then when we take the square root of the right-hand side, we're going to get the plus or minus 2i when we take the square root of the negative 4. And then we're going to move the 7 over. So we're going to have negative 7 plus or minus 2i. And then we're going to divide by 2. So we're going to have negative 7 plus or minus 2i divided by 2. Now, we could leave it like this. I, could, I would probably accept this. But since there's no radicals anywhere, it's better to break it up. You could say that this is going to be negative 7 plus 2i all divided by 2. And you could say that this could also be equal to negative 7 minus 2i all divided by 2, like this. So there's two possible uh, roots. You can see they're going to be complex because we have this imaginary number in there. And then we're going to simplify further. You could leave it like this, but we could also break it up in, as follows. You could say that this is negative 7 halves plus 2i over 2, and that this one over here will be negative 7 halves minus 2i over 2. You know, breaking fractions up like this, should it make sense if you go backwards? There's a common denominator here. So if you have the negative 7 plus the 2i, if you were to add these back together, you get back exactly what you had. And the same thing here, negative 7 minus 2i would give you exactly what you have here if you were to go backwards. So we're just taking the fraction and breaking it up instead of going backwards. So why do we do that? Because we have a cancellation of 2. So we have negative 7 halves plus just i. And then we have negative 7 halves minus i. So there's one complex number and there's another one. The real part is here. The imaginary part is here. The real part is here, the imaginary part is here. So we have negative 7 halves plus i, negative 7 halves minus i. And again, if we were to graph this function, we would find out that this parabola was hanging out in space somewhere where it never crosses the x-axis. So therefore, there's no real roots, there's no crossings. So we have just these purely complex conjugates. Notice one is a plus and one is a minus. And by the way, it's a good time to tell you that when you get complex conjugate or complex numbers as roots of polynomials, they're always going to pop up in pairs. And they're always going to pop up as conjugates. So you will never just see one of these by themselves. Uh, you'll always have them in pairs. And you'll always have them as conjugates, plus and minus. That's what conjugates are when the imaginary part has a plus and a minus kind of uh, sister term. So that's what all I wanted to talk to you about here. We're going to solve more equations. But the general idea is that when you have these perfect square uh, quadratics, 
you can just take the square root of both sides to reveal the variables. So by using radicals, we can solve these very easily uh, because of that. And you're always going to get two answers because taking the radical of both sides or the square root of both sides introduces a plus or minus term, which is consistent with we know that we're going to always get two solutions for all of these quadratics. So follow me on to the next lesson. We'll solve more of these perfect square quadratics. We'll increase the problem complexity and build your skills from there.